adults need to, if a kid is having difficulty meeting an expectation, figure out what's getting in their way. And the more they can involve the kid in that process, the better. And by the way, um, I think you are being an authority figure much more when you're doing plan B than when you're doing plan A. And I think you are holding kids accountable much better when you are engaging them in the process of solving the problems that are affecting their lives than when they are simply the passive recipients of our adult-imposed consequences. Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Hi there. Thanks so much for tuning in. That voice that you heard in the intro was Dr. Ross Green. Some of you may know Dr. Ross Green as the author of The Explosive Child. Now, don't turn this off thinking that you don't have an explosive child. Explosive is just a descriptive term for kids who become frustrated more easily. And as Ross reflects on in this episode, if he could retitle this book, he would call it something along the lines of, things are challenging between the kid and the caregiver. At its core, Ross's work addresses when children are unable or maybe seemingly unwilling to meet the expectations of their parents, which is where a lot of parent-child conflict is born, unmet expectations, whether it's expectations around homework, cleaning up, staying calm. When we have expectations that our children aren't meeting, we get frustrated. And in his book, The Explosive Child, he outlines three plans, plan A, plan B, and plan C. I'm going to give you sort of a high-level overview before we go into the conversation with Ross today so you have some of the basics. Plan A is what we often default to, which is the parent very clearly sets the expectations. Go put your shoes on right now. Calm down right now. Stop yelling. Do your homework. Often plan A can be met with challenges. Many, many, if not most of us parents lean on plan A. And for some kids, that's just fine. And it works out most of the time. But for some kids, we need to look to plan B and plan C. Plan B is a collaborative problem-solving approach. Working together to hear your kid out, offer empathy, allow them to hear your side, and then together coming up with a solution. This can be really effective at resolving parent-child conflict. Now, sometimes we need plan C. Plan C is when we remove the expectation. As parents, sometimes we can be pretty rigid and fail to notice when our expectations aren't age or developmentally appropriate, or maybe when they just don't even matter that much. So plan C is not giving up. Plan C is actually pretty strategic. In my work with families, we often use Ross Green's model, which has evolved from the explosive child into something that he calls CPS, Collaborative and Proactive Solutions, which is a more in-depth model. I think that anyone can read the book to get the basics, but this is one of those things where it can be hard to implement it on your own. So sometimes having the helping hand of a professional is necessary. And even if you're not a big reader or if you have a partner who does not read parenting books, you can get the abridged version of The Explosive Child on Audible. It's like two and a half hours long. Think about it like an extended podcast. All right, hopefully that gave you the lay of the land to understand the conversation that Ross and I are about to have. We're going to talk about plan A, plan B, plan C, and also about CPS, which is Ross's more involved, in-depth version of the program. What I love most about it is that it's respectful. And it's also skill building. When kids work through this process together with their parents, they're learning flexibility, they're learning problem-solving skills, conflict management. There's so much potential for growth. 
Without further ado, here's my chat with Ross. Hi, Ross. How are you? I am well. Yourself? I am good. I'm so glad to have you here. Your voice is so familiar to me because I've done a lot of your trainings. So it's nice to have you live and in person. I appreciate you inviting me to do this. Yeah. So I think that many people listening have probably read your, was it was The Explosive Child your first book? It was. When, when did that first come out? That was 98. Wow. Oh my goodness. So that was fairly early in your career then. Or um, where were you at? I mean, I, I left, I got, I was done with graduate school in 89. Okay. So yeah, I guess we would call that pretty early in my career. Okay. So tell us, well, first tell us a little bit about The Explosive Child and how it's changed over the years. Um, well, we've made the model a lot more accessible for people, a lot easier for people to use. You know, my goal in writing The Explosive Child was to have a book that people could actually read and actually do what's in the book. Um, and lots of people can. Some people still need a little help along the way. But, you know, basically The Explosive Child kind of set out a fairly new way of understanding and handling kids' concerning behaviors. Um, big change is to view the concerning behaviors as um, the product of lagging skills rather than lagging motivation. That's huge. Um, and um, instead of using sticker charts and other forms of rewards and punishments to try to modify behavior in the collaborative and proactive solutions model, as it has come to be called, um, you are solving problems with kids collaboratively and proactively. Um, that was fairly revolutionary as well. Um, so that's The Explosive Child, and it's now in like its fifth or sixth edition. I can't remember. Uh, my publisher doesn't love it because I they don't love when I keep revising my books. It's <laughs> not fun for them. But right. I always want to make sure that the most current rendition of the model is what's being out, what's being put out there. Right. And I heard you once say that if you could change the name of it, you would call it things are not going well between kid and caregiver. <laughs> and I love that <laughs> because I do think a lot of people are kind of turned off by the name. Have you heard that? Um, a lot of, I've heard that a lot of kids are turned off by the name, but um, if they see it sitting on the parents, you know, night table. Mm, yeah. But I think the biggest issue is that it, um, uh, it makes it sound like it's only about kids who explode when the reality is it's just as relevant to kids who implode. Um, so that, that name would not have been my first choice and in fact was not my first choice, but as a first time author, um, well, that's the name of the book. Yeah. I think that most parents see that name and they think, well, do I have an explosive child? What is the criteria for an explosive child? So what would you say to parents who ask that question? Uh, don't worry about what the criteria for an explosive child are. If you need help parenting your kid, then this probably the book that's going to help you. Mm, I love that. And that is a very different pivot from a lot of books. I think that you really work hard in your model to move away from pathologizing behavior and sets of behaviors. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. Um, well, I don't see kids with concerning behaviors as being all that different from the rest of us. And so I don't really see the point in pathologizing them. I, I find that that's a road that a lot of parents go down first and then discover that the pathologizing the kid road really didn't capture what was really going on. And so I find that we can probably skip the pathologizing part and go straight to um, irrespective of your kid's diagnosis, here are some things that we know about your kid and why they are responding poorly to life's problems and frustrations. And here's what you can do about it. Not sure that pathologizing is a particularly helpful step along the way. Yeah. I, I know that a lot of people, when they when their children are diagnosed with a behavior-related disorder, like ADHD or oppositional defiant disorder, that they feel like, okay, this is information, but what do I do now? And that piece, a lack of really good, solid information there. 
Well, you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of books out there for what they should do now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm not positive. Maybe that we easy are to access <laughs> information. Yeah. Well, um, and the more pathologizing you do, the less accessible the information seems to be. The other thing about pathologizing is that you make it sound like every kid who carry a particular diagnosis is sort of the same. And the reality is that every kid who carries a particular diagnosis is different in some of the most meaningful ways. Um, and so I find that a lot of caregivers start saying, well, well, that in that my kid is ADHD in these ways is oppositionally fine disorder in these ways. Um, anxious uh, has a little t- twist of autism spectrum disorder. Um, but now where are they? Mm-hmm. they nowhere yet. So the goal is to help them understand their kid. Um, and I'm not sure that a diagnosis does that particularly well. Yeah. In some cases, I think it can be incredibly supportive and helpful. And however, from the parent perspective, being in the home with a child on the day-to-day basis, I think that's where a tool like yours comes in really handy. That's the hope is for it to come in handy. Yeah. So you had said that your model focuses on understanding the lagging skills. What are the lagging skills that you see most often with kids who explode or implode? Well, the four biggies are flexibility, adaptability, frustration tolerance, problem solving, emotion regulation. If we wanted to slice and dice those, we could come up with dozens of even more specific skills. But I find that those global skills are really sometimes all you need to recognize that it's lagging skills that are contributing to concerning behavior. Um, and that, you know, that's not original. That comes straight from the research. Um, what is original is how much attention I pay to it. There are many people who are being trained in how to work with children's behavior who don't get taught anything about lagging skills, which is really quite mind blowing. Um, to me, it's the first place you start. Yeah. Now, With these lagging skills, there are a lot of professionals out there who are trying to teach them directly. Can Mm. you talk about that versus your approach? Well, um, I think the jury is out on whether, you know, there are a lot of cognitive skills that can be taught directly. Um, Reading, writing, math, spelling, entering a group, starting a conversation, I am less certain about the effectiveness of teaching flexibility, adaptability, frustration tolerance, problem solving, and emotion regulation through direct instruction. Um, Maybe someday those will make more sense to me as skills that can be taught through direct instruction. Right now, um, I think the jury's out. Okay. So if we're not teaching them directly, then how are kids going to gain these skills? Well, you get a lot of practice and a lot of modeling and a lot of enhancement of these skills by participating in the process of solving problems collaboratively and proactively, because the process um, requires those skills. Um, So that's how we find that a lot of kids see great enhancement in those skills, just by participating in the process of solving the problems that are affecting their lives, which is kind of nice because then you're not just solving the problem. You're not just improving the kid's behavior, but you're also enhancing their skills. I I like that three for one sale. Mm, Yeah. So rather than reading them a book about flexibility, which can be lovely as well, having them participate in this problem solving process where they are really being flexible in times when it's not easy for them. That is correct. And so you're doing it proactively then this indirect instruction, we might call it, is um, helping them acquire these skills outside the heat of the moment, which I think is much better timing. Yeah. So your problem solving process where you identify what the unmet expectations are and you solve the problem together with the child, that is done proactively. Now, I will say as a parent, sometimes that part is really hard for me. Can you talk a little bit more about being proactive in these things? Because often it seems like there's not a rhyme or reason and new things pop up all the time. New things do pop up because um, new expectations are being placed on kids all the time. 
Fortunately, they are meeting probably more expectations than they're not. So the list of expectations they're having difficulty meeting is finite. The good news is you can identify those expectations that the kid is having chronic difficulty meeting reliably, proactively. You can then prioritize and you can start solving problems proactively. And that's where the instrument that I developed called the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems is crucial because it helps people identify what expectations a kid is having difficulty meeting proactively so that they don't have to deal with those unmet expectations in the heat of the moment. Um, but I agree with you that takes us out of our normal way of operating. Our normal way of operating is to wait until a problem pops up yet again before we deal with it. Unfortunately, then we end up dealing with it time after time after time after time. And that's just the sign that the problem isn't solved yet. And that could be an indication either that we're actually not trying to solve the problem because rewards and punishments don't do that, or that we haven't done it proactively and we keep trying to do it in the heat of the moment and those tend not to be our best solutions. Hmm. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about plan A, plan B, and plan C. This is sort of the shorthand that I developed quite some time ago with the explosive child for the different ways in which adults handle problems and unmet expectations in kids. And plan A is where you're trying to solve a problem unilaterally. And that's where the adult is deciding what the solution is and imposing it on the kid. And you are doing almost none of that when you're doing the collaborative and proactive solutions model. Plan B is where you're solving the exact same problem collaboratively, same exact problem, just a completely different approach to getting it solved. And then the third plan is called Plan C. Um, and that's where you are putting on hold some of your expectations, either because you have too many unsolved problems to deal with all at once, and because if you try to solve all of them at once, you're going to end up solving none of them at all. But also because you may have decided that some of the expectations you're putting on your kid, either you don't even care that much about, or that you don't think your kid can even meet those expectations right now. And there's really no point in putting expectations on a kid if you're fairly certain they can't meet them. Um, and so the whole goal is to help parents prioritize, to decide up front, not in the heat of the moment, whether this is a problem they're trying to solve right now with their kid or whether this is one they are putting on hold for now and trying to make sure that the problem solving is as proactive as possible. That's the design. So in some ways, do these three plans equate with the parenting styles, authoritarian, authoritative, and permissive? Not really, um, because okay. that would make us think that plan C is permissive, and plan C is really prioritizing. Okay. Um, and so, no, I don't think it, I don't think it uh, coincides that well with that paradigm. Do you get a lot of parents thinking that plan C is being permissive and pushing back on not wanting to do that for that reason? Yes, but because we are aware that that is almost everybody's first thought, that if you're doing plan C, you're giving in or you're giving up on an expectation, we almost, as we are introducing plan C, we are telling them that that's not what plan C is. Okay. So really embracing that and recognizing that you haven't lost a battle if you choose plan C, that plan C is actually a wise choice. No, I mean, um, number one, um, the kid probably isn't meeting the expectation anyway, so there's really no harm. You know, th that, that lives, leaves adults with a choice of keep putting the expectation on the kid that mm -hmm. you already know the kid can't meet, cause concerning behavior and all that goes along with it, or make it official. Um, we don't expect the kid to meet the expectation right now, right? That's not permissive. That's smart. That's knowing yeah. your kid. That's um, prioritizing. Those are all good things for parents to be doing. We live in set, we, uh, in our society, we are so paranoid of giving in or giving up that I think many people who would initially, who might actually embrace plan C, have a little bit of trouble with it in the beginning because they think it's weak or they think it's passive. They think it's permissive. Mm -hmm. It is none of the above. Yeah. 
And and I ask that question because I've had par- I've had parents say to me, um, "Don't kids need to learn how to respect their elders and just take commands?" Which sort of implies, "Don't kids just need Plan A?" Yeah. Um, let me. My response to that would probably be: Adults need to make sure that the expectations they're putting on kids are expectations kids can actually reliably meet. And adults need to, if a kid is having difficulty meeting an expectation, figure out what's getting in their way. And the more they can involve the kid in that process, the better. And by the way, um, I think you are being an authority figure much more when you're doing plan B than when you're doing plan A. And I think you are holding kids accountable much better when you are engaging them in the process of solving the problems that are affecting their lives than when they are simply the passive recipients of our adult imposed consequences. So it's actually an interesting discussion point. Yeah. And, you know, since learning about plan B, it, it makes so much sense to me, right? As, as parents, one of our jobs is to raise kids that are problem solvers and can figure out what they need to do when, and if we don't give them the opportunity to practice that skill in real life with things that matter to them, then how are they going to just magically acquire that when they turn 18? Uh, I don't have an answer to that question. But I, think, <laughs> Sorry. I, think it, I think it explains why so many kids um, start acting like they're three years old the minute they get to college. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Would you say that you find that men or women are more likely to lean towards plan A? Mm. Um, in my experience, that has not been the case. Um, I've run okay. into many, many plan A moms. I think that if we were paying attention to stereotypes, we would probably assume that more men are inclined toward plan A. But in my work with parents and educators, I have actually not found that to be the case. The heart of it, it's still there. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of parents out there who don't want to make the same mistakes their parents did who feel okay giving their kids voice, who see the wisdom in engaging kids in solving the problems that affect their lives. Um, And then I think that there's a lot of parents who just haven't gotten that memo yet. Um, And you know what? That's human diversity. And that's why um, I'm still a very busy guy trying to get to as many people as we can. Yeah, it's a work in progress. I think that I see a lot of moms, especially leaning towards plan A, as it relates to anxiety, this anxiety of like, we've got to get all the things done. We've got a busy schedule. And if we don't get it done in this order, in this way, it's not going to be, it's not going to, it's not going to get done or it's not going to be done effectively. And that there's some control tendencies that result and end up with kids who are pushing back. Yes. Um, If I thought about it a little bit, I would say that it, the fathers who are more inclined toward plan A might be doing it more because of some traditional definition of authority. And you might be right for moms, it might be that, you know, in a lot of families, mom is the primary caregiver still, mom's dealing with the schedule, mom's dealing with a lot of stuff that dads don't have to. Of course, this is all being very stereotypical here, and I'm not sure that those stereotypes even still apply. But if you're the parent who's primarily on the hook for dealing with the kids and dealing with the schedule and dealing with the homework and dealing with meals, um, you know, that's a lot of stress and um, takes a lot to keep all of that organized. And I think that that often leads to ending up dealing with things in the heat of the moment and in a way that is very decisive. And um, if you're dealing with things in the heat of the moment, plan A is going to feel right to you, which is why we want all of this to be as planned and proactive as possible so that that doesn't have to be the default way of going about doing business. Right. Yeah. And I think that I, I'm trying to kind of recon- reconcile why one person might lean towards one plan or another yeah. more so, because then it helps us to see where we land more often, because I think many of us, myself included, do lean towards plan A more than we realize without even realizing it that, you know, I make the decision and I tell them what needs to be done. And I feel a little surprised if I pause and look how often that does happen. 
Well, number one, you may have, I don't know your history, but you may have muscle memory for plan A from childhood. That could be number mm -hmm. one. I think a lot of adults have muscle memory for plan A from childhood. So it's what they got brought up with. Um, but I also think that in the heat of the moment, human tendency is to lean toward plan A, to be decisive, to end it as quickly as possible. Um, that's why getting people out of the heat of the moment is so crucial if we want to change some of these things. We're going to pause for a one minute word from today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is KiwiCo. KiwiCo knows a thing or two about delivering moments of discovery through fun, hands-on projects. Each month, they deliver super cool science, technology, and art projects for kids. Most recently, we got a marine biologist box, which is perfectly timed because we're planning on taking our kids on their very first cruise soon, and we're going to do some snorkeling. So they really enjoyed learning about marine life. There's something for kids of all ages, and as parents, we absolutely learn through every project as well. Learning together as a family helps to keep everyone engaged and gives us something to continue to talk about and add to conversation later on. So make 2023 the year of discovery with KiwiCo. Get 50% off your first month of any crate line at kiwico.com forward slash simple. That's 50% off your first month at kiwico.com slash simple. Thanks for supporting our sponsors. Back to my chat with Ross. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about plan B because that's the sweet spot in the middle. And I think that so many of us as parents struggle with finding that in between that you do what I say because I say so and okay, let's let go of this expectation for today and move on. Um, so what does plan B look like? Plan B is where you're solving the problem collaboratively. It's three steps. They are called the empathy step, the define adult concerns step, and the invitation step. As I always tell people, the names of the steps don't matter that much. The ingredients matter a lot. The main ingredient of the empathy step is gathering information from the kid so as to understand what's making it hard for the kid to meet a particular expectation. What is making it hard for the, and, and you know what, the interesting thing here, uh, as I always say, the empathy step is where we adults discover that what we thought was getting in the kid's way is not what was getting in the kid's way. We adults have just any variety of theories for why we think a kid is having difficulty meeting a particular expectation. Laziness is high on the list. Um, he can do it when he wants to is a very popular expression, especially among people who haven't yet talked to the kid about what's actually making it hard for the kid to meet the expectation. Um, so there's a lot of crucial information to be gathered from a kid about what's making it hard. And that's whether it's difficulty with a particular homework assignment or difficulty turning off the Xbox to come in for dinner or difficulty eating what mom or dad has made for dinner or difficulty being in bed by 8.30 p.m. with the lights off or you name it, we need info. That's the empathy step. The define adult concern step is where the adult is entering their concern into consideration. And adult concerns can trace back to the question, why do you think it's important that the expectation be met? As I'm frequently telling caregivers, if you don't know why it's important that the expectation be met, then I don't know why you have the expectation. But adult concerns usually fall into one or both of two categories, how the unsolved problems affecting the kid, how the unsolved problems affecting other people. Um, and in both categories, the concerns are usually related to things like health or safety or learning. That about covers it. Amazing that the universe of things that we adults tend to be concerned about fall into just one or many of three categories, but that's the reality. And then the third step is the invitation. This is where kid and caregiver are collaborating on a solution. But as I always say, a solution that must meet two criteria. It's got to be realistic. Both parties got to be able to do what they're agreeing to do. And more important than that even is that both solution, the solution has to be mutually satisfactory, meaning it truly addresses the concerns of both parties. 
Now that's a, that's a switch for many adults. Now, with many adults, especially those who are inclined toward plan A, their only concern that needs to be addressed is their own. Well, if you want a kid to care about your concerns, you need to care about theirs too. Um, and you know, you asked a question earlier about respect. It's a very, this is a model that is very respectful toward kids. And I find that respect begets respect. Plan A begets plan A. You use power on a kid, you're gonna get power back. You collaborate with a kid, you're gonna get collaboration back. If you're interested in a kid's concerns, they're gonna be interested in yours. If you're giving a kid voice, they'll be more interested in listening to your voice. If you are willing to come up with solutions that not only address your own concerns, but also theirs, they will reciprocate. Um, I'm having trouble thinking of any downside to any of that. Yeah. So could we do a little role play where you're the parent and I'm the kid? Sure. Okay. Um, so the unmet expectation, I'm, let's pretend I'm 14 year old Danae with a messy room. Um, so the unmet expectation is having a hard time, having difficulty cleaning my room. Did I word that well? Beautiful. Okay. Um, and this was a real life problem for many, many years for me. So I'll be able to, to play it well. You are that kid. <laughs> yes. Still sort of. I mean. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Danae, I've noticed that you've been having difficulty keeping your room clean. What's up? Yeah. Um, it's clean enough. Clean enough for me. Got it. So I'm going to take a break from our role play for a quick second just to help okay. people know what we're doing here. Um, there are drilling strategies that we've developed for how to gather information from a kid. And the reason that's coming up now is because you said it's clean enough. And for many people, that would sound like a conversation stopper. Like, what do you say to that? Mm -hmm. What you say to that is the default drilling strategy, which is reflective listening. Um, which is where you're basically saying back to the kid, whatever the kid just said to you, accompanied by a clarifying question or statement, like, how so? Or I don't quite understand. Or can you say more about that? Or I'm confused. So here we go. Um, you feel that your room is clean enough. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. You don't have to come into my room. It's my stuff. It's my space. And I feel okay with the way that it is right now. And it, I, I, don't, know, I don't know why it bothers you. Got it. Well, we'll get to why it bothers me in the second step. <laughs> but I'm not going to go there yet. But by the way, as a parent, and by the way, I just took a break from the conversation again. As a parent, I am now, first of all, if this is a unsolved problem that's been causing an enormous amount of heat of the moment conflict, then I might have just heard something new. There's a chance that I just heard something new. And if I'm willing to think about something that's something new that I just heard, I might say to myself, well, you know, Danae's got a point. I don't have to go in there. Uh, she's 14. I guess there's a point at which she gets to define what it means to have a clean room. Now, how much do I really care about this expectation? Let's say that I do, right? If I don't, I'm gonna say, you know what, Danae? You've got a point there. Uh, I think I won't go in your room anymore. And I think I'm gonna leave it up to you to decide um, how clean you wanna keep your room. That's if I decide I don't care, right? Danae, you've made a good point. 14 year old Danae has made a good point. I've taken it into consideration. I've listened and um, I've decided that I'm gonna drop that expectation. Let's say that's not the direction that, that it went in, right? It's always an option, but let's say that it's not. Now I need to, we're not ready for my concerns yet because we're not done with the empathy step yet. Um, so you feel that you're very comfortable with the level of cleanliness of your room. This is reflective listening again, and I don't need to go in there if I don't want to. Um, tell me more about that. Well, I mean, I don't know if I'd use the word comfortable because it's not very comfortable when like there's stuff everywhere. I mean, I would like it to be cleaner, but it is what it is at this point. It's been like yeah. this for years. Got it. So yes, 
So what you're saying is that it's been a long time, but I'm also hearing you say that you actually kind of wish it was cleaner. Yeah, I do. What do you think is getting in the way of it being cleaner? I just don't have a place to put all my things. Danae, you're making this too easy, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. I've got so many things that I don't know where to put any of them. So they end up under the bed, filling the closet and... Ah, so you do wish your room would be cleaner, but you have so much stuff that you don't know have a place to put everything. Yeah, I think I need some more shelves. Got it. Danae, you're making this way too easy. But um, is there anything else that you feel is making it hard for you to have a clean room? Um... No, I don't think so. I think, I mean, I would love to have a clean room, but it's just really hard for me to have a clean room. I just, it's not something that comes easy like it does to you. It's easy for you to be clean, but it's not easy for me. Got it. So it's also hard for you to be clean. um, Even if you had um, a place to put everything because you have a lot of stuff, cleaning your room is hard for you. Yeah. Got it. So if, I'm going to use a different drilling strategy here, by the way, this one's called tabling. If um, you had a place to put your stuff, and if cleaning your room wasn't hard for you, is there anything else that would be making it difficult for us to have a, for us, for you to have a clean room? Um, no, I mean, I guess I just... If it was easier for me, I think my room would be clean. But it's, yeah, I think it's just the fact that it's really hard. That's Got what's it. getting in the way. Got it. And when you say hard, I'm just going to stay on that a little bit longer because I really want to understand this. Um, aside from the fact that you have a lot of stuff and aside from the fact that you don't have a place to put it, when you say that it's hard for you and that it's easier for me, what do you mean by that? Well, you just always put everything away and everything is always clean in your room. So I, yeah, I mean, I just think it comes a lot easier to you. Got it. I tend, tend to lose my stuff more. Got it. And so it takes more conscious effort for you to stay on top of the room being clean. Yeah. Got it. Okay. I think we're ready for the next step. My concern is that, um, well, my concern has changed a little bit. My first concern was that you lose a lot of stuff and that that makes it hard for you to find the things that you need um, and very inconvenient for you. And I know that it upsets you sometimes when you can't find something that you want. So I'd like to make that easier for you. Um, I was thinking that sometimes it's kind of unsanitary in your room. Um, you know, how occasionally there's food in there or dishes in there, um, and dirty clothes are not sanitary. And then I know sometimes you lose track of whether clothes are clean or not. And then you sometimes get upset if, um, you don't have clean clothes to wear. Um, so I'm glad to hear you say that you'd like your room to be cleaner than it is, because I share that goal with you. And I'm glad to know that it's hard for you um, and that if you just had a place to put your stuff, because there's a lot of stuff, that might really make quite a dent here. Um, so I guess those are my concerns, that um, this is that, that having the room not be clean can be upsetting for you in, in many different ways, either because you don't have clean clothes or from my perspective that it's unsanitary. Um, and that you'd like it to be cleaner. Um, So here comes the invitation. I wonder if there's a way for us to make sure, well, that you have a place to put your stuff and to see if there's a way to make all of this less overwhelming and for you to be able to stay on top of it and also make sure that you have clean clothes to wear and... um, that it's not so overwhelming for you to have your stuff 
all over your room. Do you have any ideas? Well, I think that um, one thing that's really hard for me is hanging up my clothes. So I think if I didn't have to hang up my clothes and could just put them somewhere, um, somewhere else that's easy to get into. Um, and also with my dresser, I have a hard time remembering what goes in what drawer. So that just doesn't seem to be working for me. So then I just leave all the clothes in a basket and I don't put them anywhere. Got it. So, um, how can we, what, what can we do about that? I don't know. Maybe we add some shelves into open shelves into my closet that I, where I can see things rather than having hangers since I never hang anything up anyways. Mm -hmm. I know you really want me to hang things up. You're always telling me I need to hang things up. Otherwise they're going to get ruined, but they end up in a pile anyways. Well, hanging things up is my way of organizing clothes, but it doesn't have to be your way. There's more than one way to accomplish this mission. And we certainly, if my way of keeping things organized doesn't work for you, then that's kind of pointless. Um, but if your way of organizing things is going to make more sense to you, let me ask you, do you want to get rid of your bureau completely and replace it with things that you can see and perhaps even things that have labels on them? Containers? Yeah, I do think labels would be would be helpful. Yes, th things I can see and things that where there's labels. I think that would be easier for me to put things away. You could put them in bins that have labels on them as opposed to hanging them up? Yeah. I definitely. Got it. Um, would you like, should you and I go to the container store, look for bins that you think might work for you? Um, you know, you're 14 at this point, and I know that you're not always crazy about my input, but would you like me just to have a little, do you want me to help you organize or do you want to do it all on your own? And I'm good either way. I don't want your help. Got it. Then um, are we getting rid of your bureau completely? I mean, I really like the way that it looks and I know it was expensive. So I think we can keep it, but I don't think that I should put my clothes in there anymore. So what we're talking about is getting some containers. I guess you'd have to think about how many. You might want to think in advance about what the labels on the containers should be so that we are taking into account how much of that you have and um, how many containers we need. And when do you want to go to the container store? And, and do you think this is a good start on a solution that will solve this problem? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. What, you want to go on Saturday? Sure. Let's go on Saturday. Um, I can do it in the morning, but not in the afternoon. I know that you like to sleep late. Can we go at like 11 a.m. on Saturday? Yeah. Okay. That works. I'm glad we talked about this because otherwise we'd still just be yammering at each other over it. And I learned a lot by hearing what's getting in your way. And I think we have a solution that's going to address a lot of those things. So thanks. Thank you. That's roughly what a plan B would sound like. Yeah. You know what I felt? You were so flexible. And it just makes me think of how sometimes adults can be just as inflexible as kids, that maybe that's a lagging skill for a lot of adults too. Lagging skill for the for the, for a lot of species. Um, you know, um, inflexibility doesn't solve a lot. And to tell you the truth, I wasn't. I'm glad that what your perception is that I was being flexible. Um, from my perspective, what I was trying to do in the empathy step is understand why not let kids figure out what works for them as long as it's feasible. And by the way, if it's not feasible, then that enters into the discussion, right? If, if the kid comes up with a solution that's not feasible, then that's not a solution we're going to go with. A lot of people get the wrong idea about this approach, and that is that you're going to go with the first thing the kid suggests, and the adult has no input on the solution. That's not true. Um, and what was interesting is the more I demonstrated a willingness, and I know we were role-playing, which is always a little bit contrived, but the more... I demonstrated my willingness to listen um, and to meet you where you're at, the more willing you were to reciprocate. And that's the way it works. But it also works that way with inflexibility. The more inflexible I am, the more inflexible I would anticipate that you would be in response. 
And um, then it becomes a power struggle. And now we're wasting our time. Yeah. I think the part when you said um, there's more than one way to, when I said I didn't want to hang up the hangers and you said there's more than one way to organize and maybe Mm -hmm. my way doesn't work for you. That felt very, um, just very empathic. Like, wow, like really? Like, even though like we're related, we might do things differently and that's okay. Like that just felt very groundbreaking to me as a 14 year old. (laughs) Well, you know, the gene pool expresses itself in many different ways. So just because we're related doesn't mean we're going to do things exactly the same. Yeah. But I mean, I think some of us, especially when we're so overwhelmed and caught up in our own rigidity that like we just feel like, and I say some of us because I'm one of those people that I feel like my way is the best way and it must be the way for everyone. Right. Your way is the best way for you. Mm-hmm. But you know, as parents or as educators, we like to think we want kids to benefit from our experience we make the mistake of thinking that our experience is the universal experience and that the solutions we arrived at through our experience are going to work for everybody, um, which is where a lot of advice giving comes from, right? But not a lot of collaboration comes from. Um, yeah. It's about meeting kids where they're at. And once again, the more willing we are to meet kids where they're at, the more willing they're going to be able to meet us where we're at. And the truth is, who cares what the solution is as long as both parties are good with it? And as long as it addresses the concerns of both parties, who cares? Why is there such a premium on being the person who comes up on the, with a solution? The premium should be on being the person who facilitates coming up with a solution that works for both of us. Yeah. I like that distinction between moving from advice giving to collaboration. Right. Because, I mean, how wonderful is it to hear your kid come up with a solution? Right. Right. Like to be able to do that, like that's just, that's pretty amazing. I mean, you're doing something right if you're raising a kid that can problem solve and come up with solutions. Right. And I get, when I was raising my two, and I'm still, I guess, raising them, but not really. They're 22 and 25 at this point. Um, when they ask me for guidance, it is so still easy for me to say, well, here's what I would do. But I think they appreciate it more that I help them think it through and come to their own solutions. Um, good. I like that better. Yeah. yeah, I do too. So talk to me a little bit about the generalization of these skills. Like, are we going to be plan being forever or what, where does it go from there with every single unmet expectations you have to sit down and do this? Uh, well, some are going to solve by solving others. So the answer to the question is no, but here's what we hope starts to happen. We hope that by giving kids practice at this new skill called problem solving, they will start to own it, they'll start to use it, and they're going to start solving problems on their own. And this, by the way, is another great benefit of Plan C. Let's say you are the parent of a regular old kid. You don't have a big pile of unsolved problems. You feel that your kid is sort of pretty typical. Plan C is also where you've noticed that there's an expectation that the kid is having difficulty meeting, but you are waiting to see if they can solve it on their own. Um, And I talked about this mostly in my book, Raising Human Beings, because that's a different use of Plan C than prioritizing. Um, Waiting to see if a kid can solve it on their own is a very good way to promote independence in kids because now you're not jumping in the minute you see something going wrong, you're giving them a chance to solve the problem. Even in kids who are really needing plan B really badly, um, to get the ball rolling on them as a problem solver, um, eventually that's gonna take. Their, Their skills in that realm aren't static. There's experience happening here. There's learning happening here. There's a skill being practiced and enhanced here. Um, So I think it's a pretty safe bet to imagine that the kid will take what they're learning through this process and start to apply it. And therefore, you're not going to have to solve as many as you might think. Yeah, that thought. So planned C being not just dropping the demand, but also thinking of it as masterly inactivity. Have you ever heard that term? I have not, but I like it. So deliberately being inactive as a way of making space for a kid to solve their own problem. That's right. Not forever. Yeah. Um, but for now, you're giving your kid a chance to solve it themselves. 
which is exactly the contrary to what's known as the helicopter parent, right? Who is managing everything and solving everything and controlling everything? Um, if that's what you're doing, how is your kid going to be able to learn how to do this? Um, mm -hmm. And I think you said that earlier. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I was reflecting on the unsolved problem of the messy bedroom, and when you said most of the the problems that arise that are cause explosive behaviors and cause challenges are related to health, safety, and learning, and that one isn't the, the messy bedroom isn't really it, when you think about it in those terms, is it really related to health, safety, or learning? It's not, doesn't feel so pressing. So I don't know. I think that's, but it's a hard one for parents to let go of. Right. Well, some parents feel more strongly about a clean bedroom than others. Um, I like my children's bedrooms to be neat, but just as an example, I didn't really care if their beds were made. Right. And to tell you the truth, I don't care if my bed is made. So why would I have a double standard? But what's interesting is my, um, now I'm having trouble remembering who it was. I think it was my daughter whose bed was always made beautifully and my son's who was not. Boy, that's a detail I wish I could remember. Although it doesn't really matter at this point. Uh, one of them kept a clean bed, any, kept a neat bed anyways. The other didn't. I didn't feel strongly about that one. So that expectation actually never got put on them. In mm -hmm. some families where kids are leaving dirty plates and yeah. dirty, sweaty socks, it can be a health issue. But what was interesting about the plan B that we did is that you were saying that you didn't like having a messy room either and that it was hard for you and that you wish you could do something about it. And that made it... Um, so that I didn't really have to come up with a super explicit concern because you and I were actually concerned about the exact same thing. That's mm -hmm. not the way it usually goes, but that made that took a little bit of pressure off of me as the parent to try to come up with a super robust concern. You and I were actually concerned about the same thing. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So who can do this model, CPS, can it be done with a three-year-old? Can it be done with a child or adult with intellectual disabilities? Like, who is it right for? Uh, well, first of all, any adult can do it with a kid if they're interested. And, um, you know, the biggest variable is communication skills. And there are people who solve problems collaboratively with kids who are non-speaking all the time and kids who have very low IQs to the degree that that's a reference point for anybody anymore. Um, I, don't, I don't sell any kid short when it comes to trying to engage them in solving the problems that affect their lives. Um, otherwise, they end up being completely dependent on us to solve problems for them and to run their lives, and I just do not think that's the direction we want to go in. Okay. Um, so my last question for you is regarding screen time plan B around screen time. Have you found that this has been a harder topic to handle um, with um, coming to conclusions or I don't know, what are your thoughts or is it just really dependent on the situation? Um, I, I agree that it is a hard one. I don't know if I'd rank it as harder than most. I find that with, um, Perhaps with screen time more than some other unsolved problems, people forget that they should put their concerns on the table in the first two steps and try instead to throw solutions at each other right from the very beginning. Three hours, no one hour, no three hours, no one hour. Um, when what we really want are the concerns of both parties on the table. Um, here's a show that I wanna make sure that I don't miss but I do not have to watch it right when it's on. Um, or in the case of screen time related to video games, I don't wanna lose my level. I'm playing with kids in the internet and I can't just walk away from the game. So I find that the more we are focused on concerns before we start trying to think of solutions, the easier that one is to solve, though I would not call that one an easy one to solve. It's just a lot easier if you're talking about concerns way before you're talking about solutions. Okay. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I feel like for many of us as parents, especially throughout the pandemic, we've kind of, we've been round and round about the screen time, right? Right. We've tried a million different things to limit it, to arrange it, to schedule it. And it's always, it feels kind of like a brainstorming session about what to do next. So approaching this from, approaching screen time from a CPS perspective, we would be looking to understand the, their concerns first and then presenting ours and then Correct. a solution. If there are no, if we haven't done concerns, if we're only brainstorming solutions that we really, then we don't really have a reference point for what needs to be addressed for this problem to be solved. So in that respect, brainstorming is sort of um, the shotgun approach to coming up with solutions. We really would rather take aim at the concerns of both parties. That's our reference point for any solution. Okay. Yeah. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I feel like it's a good way to sort of reset on for so many families who have had the conversation over and over again, but not done it from this perspective, that right? Not really heard 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 the child out. And um, I do think we try to place a lot of rules and boundaries around screen time without really understanding what our kids' perspective is on it. Um, never bad to give a kid voice. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Do you have anything new in the works, Ross? Anything to look forward to? Something new in the works. Um, (laughs) There are new books in the works that I don't want to talk about yet. There's a new video in the works that I don't want to talk about yet. But all of these things will be on the Lives in the Balance website sooner than later, especially the new video. Okay. Anywhere else we can find you other than the website? That's the ideal place to find me. All right. And you have loads of research and resources there. We do. Great. Thank you so much, Ross. I appreciate it. That I, I appreciate you asking me to do this. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Dr. Ross Green. If you want to learn more about him and the things that we talked about today, go to simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 337. When you get a moment, leave a rating or review for this show. I appreciate your support. Thanks for being here.